In the last few videos, we've talked about managing registers. In this video, we're going to take a few moments to talk about another very important resource, the cache, and what compilers can and can't do to manage them. Modern computer systems have quite elaborate memory hierarchies, and so if we were to start at the closest uh, level to the processor itself, uh, we would find that on the chip there are some number of registers, and these are very fast to access. So typically uh, they can be accessed in a single cycle, so at the same rate uh, as the clock frequency. And the problem is that it's very expensive uh, to build such high performance memory, and so we don't get to have very much of it typically. Uh, you know, you might have 256, say, to 8K uh, bytes of registers uh, total uh, available to you on a given processor. Now, a very significant portion of the die area on a modern processor would be devoted to the cache. And the cache is also quite high performance, but not quite as high performance as registers. Maybe on average it would take three cycles uh, to service something from the cache, but you get a lot more of it. And modern processors would have up to a megabyte of cache. Then, much further away uh, from the processor is the main memory, the DRAM. And this is uh, much more expensive to, uh, to access in time. Uh, you know, typical values would be 20 to 100 cycles, and I think you know, it's more on the 100, uh, towards the 100 end than the 20 end these days in, in most processors. Uh, but you get quite a lot of it. You get uh, between 32 megabytes. Um, that would be a fairly uh, small machine, uh, up to 4 gigabytes for a, a maximally provisioned uh, processor. And finally, furthest away, um, is uh, typically disk, and this takes a very, very long time to get to hundreds of thousands or millions of cycles, but you can have enormous amounts of storage out there, gigabytes to terabytes of storage. Now, as I said, there are limitations on the size and speed of registers and caches, and these are limited as much by power, actually, as, as anything else these days. And, uh, and so it's, you know, very important. Uh, people would like to have as much register and cache as possible, but uh, there are real constraints on how big and how fast uh, we can make these relative to the speeds of the processors. Now, unfortunately, the cost of a cache miss is very high, as we saw in the previous slide. If you, you could get something in a couple of cycles from the cache, but if it's not in the cache, then it could take you uh, a couple of orders of magnitude longer uh, to get it out of the main memory. And so for this reason, uh, people, uh, you know, try to build uh, caches uh, in between the processor and the main memory to hide that latency of the main memory. So that, you know, most of the data is in the cache. And typically it requires more than one level of cache these days uh, to uh, match a fast processor well with the speed of a very large main memory. So you know, very common now to have two levels of cache in processors and some processors even have three levels of cache. So uh, the bottom line is that it's very important uh, to, uh, for high performance uh, to manage these resources properly, in particular to manage the registers and the cache as well if you want your program to perform well. Compilers have become very good at managing registers, and in fact, I think today most people would agree that for almost all programs, compilers do a better job uh, at managing registers than programmers can. And so it's very worthwhile to leave the job of allocating registers or assigning registers to the compiler. However, compilers are not good at managing caches. And while there's a little bit that compilers can do, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, in the rest of this video, uh, the, for the most part, if programmers want to get good cache performance, they have to understand the behavior of the caches on the machine, they have to understand what their program is doing, they have to understand a little bit about what the compiler uh, is capable of doing, and then they still have to uh, write the program in such a way that it is going to, to be cache friendly. So it's still very much an open question uh, how much a compiler can do to improve cache performance, although there are a few things uh, that we found that compilers can do reliably. So to see one of those things that compilers can actually do, uh, let's take a look at this example loop. So what do we have here? We have an outer loop on J, an inner loop on I, and then in each iteration of the inner loop, uh, we're reading from B sub I, some vector B sub I, uh, you know, you know, uh, performing some computation on that value and storing the result into the ith element of the A vector. 
Now, uh, as it turns out, this particular program has really, really terrible cache performance. This is going to behave very badly. And so let's think about um, what's going to happen. So let's imagine our cache you know, is some block of memory. Okay. And so what's going to happen here, I mean, what's, what's the first iteration going to be? Well, we're going to, you know, uh, load B sub 1 and uh, store some function of that into A sub 1. And so what's going to get loaded into the cache is A sub 1 and B sub 1. All right, let's assume they just go into different elements and let's say, uh, just for the sake of argument, let's say they land in the first two elements in the cache. Okay, and then we're going to do the second iteration of this and we'll, uh, we'll load uh, B sub 2 and write it into A sub 2. And so um, A sub 2 and B sub 2 will be loaded into the cache. All right, and so on. And this will repeat uh, over and over and over again, loading one element of A and one element of B. Uh, the important thing to notice is that all of these references to A and B are misses. Okay, every single one of these is a cache miss because on each iteration of the loop we refer to new elements. Okay, so we're not referring to the same elements uh, as we were on the previous one. So now let's ignore for the moment the fact that there may be multiple elements in the same cache line. Okay, so some of you uh, probably are aware already uh, that when we fetch uh, data from memory, we don't just fetch the one word. Okay, so typically when we refer to B sub 1, for example, uh, you know, if B sub 1 is stored here, uh, we'll fetch an entire cache line, which will be some block um, of memory, and that may well have, you know, other elements of B in it. So we might get a couple other elements of B into the cache at the same time, but the important thing here is that on every iteration of the loop, we're referring to fresh data. Okay, and, uh, and if these data values are large enough, if they take up an entire cache line, then each iteration of the loop is going to uh, be a cache miss uh, for both elements and we won't get any benefit of the cache and this loop will run at the rate of, uh, at the rate of the main memory and not at the rate of the cache. Now, the other thing that's important here is that this loop bound here is very large and I picked it to be very large to suggest that it's much larger than the size of the cache. So as we get towards the end of the loop, what's going to happen is we will have filled up the whole cache. So this whole cache will be filled with values uh, from A and B, and then it's going to start uh, clobbering values that are already in the cache. And if this loop, you know, if the size of these vectors is say twice the size of the cache, um, by the time uh, we come around and complete uh, the entire execution of the inner loop, uh, what's in the cache is the second half of the A and B arrays, not the first half of the A and B arrays. And so then when we go back around and execute another iteration of the outer loop, now what's in the cache uh, is also going to be um, not the data that we're referencing. And so when we come back around and begin the execution of the inner loop the second time and we refer to A sub 1 and B sub 1 and A sub 2 and B sub 2, what's in the cache is the uh, values from the high numbered elements of the A and B vectors, not the low numbered elements, and so these references are all misses again. And so the, the basic problem with this loop, a, a loop that's structured like this, is that almost every memory reference, uh, and, and if the data values are big enough, um, again, that they fill an entire cache line, uh, then it will be every single memory reference is a cache miss. Now, instead, let's consider an alternative structure for the same program. Here I put the I loop at the outer, uh, as the outer loop, and the J loop as the inner loop. And here what we do uh, is we uh, load B sub I, and we write to A sub I, and then we repeat that computation 10 times on the same data values. And so here we'll get excellent cache performance. We'll, we'll have a miss on the first reference, but then the subsequent nine references, uh, the data will be in the cache, or we'll completely exhaust our computation on uh, those particular A and B values. And then we'll uh, go on uh, to the next uh, A and B values. We'll finish the inner loop and go on to the outer uh, and do one more iteration of the outer loop. And so the advantage of this structure is that it brings the data into the cache and then it uses that data as much as possible before going on to the next data rather than doing a little bit on every data item uh, and then going back, you know, in, in one pass and then going back and sweeping over all data items again and doing another little bit. All right, so this particular structure where we've exchanged the order of the outer loops, uh, sorry, the exchange the order of the inner and outer loops, it computes exactly the same thing. 
uh, but it has much better ca cache behavior and it will probably run more than 10 times faster. Now, uh, compilers can perform this simple loop interchange uh, optimization. This particular kind of optimization is called loop interchange because you're just switching the order of loops. In this particular case, it's very easy to see that that's legal and a compiler uh, could actually figure it out. Um, not many compilers actually implement this optimization uh, because in general it's not easy to decide whether you can reverse the orders of, of the loops. And so usually a programmer would have to figure out that they wanted to do this in order to improve the performance of the program. 